the, those of you who didn't hear me earlier, uh, welcome please to the Maine Irish Heritage Center. My name is Vinnie O'Malley. I'm the executive director here. This is my former parish and I uh, grew up around the corner here and I could not be prouder to be standing here tonight uh, able to uh, honor uh, Michael Conley. Michael is a dear old friend of mine who uh, in 1972, as my first day in Dublin, I walked down O'Connell Street to get a paper at Eason's and Michael was walking down the stairs and of course asked me to borrow it because he didn't want to buy one of his own. Anyways, uh, we have a lot of speakers here, and guess why that is. So, you know, if you notice over there, Michael's sitting there, and he's dressed reasonably formally, but the word is probably, if you look at those, those were actually hand-me-downs from Peter. <laughs> because the way, Peter, the way things work in that family is that, if, is, is that no matter the size, if it's free, it fits. Thank you, Mary Conley, for that line. She's the funniest one of the bunch, to be honest. So anyways, uh, we're going to try to hurry through these things. I'm going to introduce, uh, we should have, and my apologies, uh, the program. We, this incredible turnout. We had an awful lot of people show up at the door. I'm very happy about that. So, but there is a, there is, there is a little, been a few snafus, but we're going to get through them. So, uh, but, so first, I would like to uh, invite up um, the Reverend Clifton Ives, uh, Reverend Ives is a retired bishop of the United Methodist Church, and he's going to do an invocation for us. It's a delight to be here with Michael and with all of you tonight. Um, I don't have a lot of Irish roots, but I have a wife who was born on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and her older brothers used to tease her and say, tell her that she was Irish. And she thought it was true for a long, long time, for a long time. In our home, at the foot of the stairs, on the wall as you come down, there is a picture frame with glass, and underneath it is an embroidered piece with shamrocks around it. And it is an embroidered piece of a, of a very familiar blessing blessing to all of you. I'm sure you all know it. You could probably recite it by heart. It's the one that begins your road. May the road rise to meet you and ends with the words, may God hold you in the hollow of God's hands. Well, tonight the road has risen to meet us here to celebrate and to honor Michael, my friend Michael, for many years we've known each other. Michael Coleman Connolly. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, for holding us together in the hollow of your hand, and for Michael, whose faithful love of all things Irish, all of that which brings us here. In this historic place, where the faithful have gathered for generations. We give thanks for the Irish Heritage Center and for the kind and welcoming one, words and persons who have met us and greeted us and prepared for our celebration and our feast. Tonight, do we, not give, we do not only give thanks for the food which you have given, but thanks for lavish us with laughter and joy and wonder as we remember the many Irish blessings and those who have blessed our city out of that heritage, our state, and our nation. Please, God, continue to hold Michael and each one gathered here in the hollow of your hand forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you again, Reverend Ice. That's important. Um, so I'm going to uh, be brief here and uh, introduce uh, Patrick, Patricia Patrick, listen to me, Patricia McDonough Dunn. And uh, she 
turns out to be cousin to pretty much everybody in the state of Maine. Uh, you know, when we do this DNA program, she has, you know, everybody else has like two pages of cousins. She has like 42 pages of cousins. So Pat has assumed the chair, and I want to make a quick shout out because Mary McElhaney, the former chair who is in the back there, that we could not be here without so many other people, but Mary McElhaney, please, Mary. So uh, Pat has assumed the mantle and, uh, and doing an incredible job. So with no further ado, I will introduce uh, Madam Chair Patricia Dunn. Thank you, Danny. Please hold on. That's it. On behalf of the board of the Maine Irish Heritage Center, I am thrilled to invite, welcome you all here tonight. This is a tremendous turnout. We are um, extremely pleased to be able to uh, be honoring Michael Conley. Um, and I just wanted to follow up when Finney said about Mary's uh, chairmanship of the board. She led us through some very difficult times. Uh, but my uh, story of how I ended up on the board is that I came to the very first CLADA dinner, which honored Governor Brennan, who is here with us tonight. And I'd known Mary for years, and I talked to her at the, at the dinner, told her it was a wonderful event, and by the time I left, I was on the board. <laughs> so here we are, a number of years later. Um, so uh, I don't want to take up too much time. I, I, you're all here to uh, hear about Michael, uh, and we want to celebrate um, this award with him. I just want to take a minute to um, mention a couple of events that are upcoming here at the center. We have a very lively um, uh, calendar of events um, that keep us all very busy. Uh, as you know, uh, 2016 is the year that we're honoring the centenary of the 1916 uh, uprising in Ireland, and we've been celebrating uh, that all during this year. And on November uh, 4th, which is going to be uh, Friday, which is the part of the first Friday Art Walk, we're going to have the Forgotten Heroines of the Easter Rising. Uh, it's an exhibition by Irish sculptor Betty Newman McGuire, uh, and that's going to start at 4 p.m., and we think that's going to be a great event, and there's more details, details about it in tonight's program. And on October 30, we have um, uh, award-winning local poet Robert Breen here um, to, to speak, and that will be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, on November 12th, uh, we will have our annual Celtic Fair. It's part of the straight State Street Stroll with uh, fairs going on up and down State Street, so we hope you can enjoy it. Join us at all those events. And uh, I think it's time for us to get on with the celebration, so I think that um, Jerry Conley is the next person that should be coming up here as our MC. So, Jerry. Thank you, uh, Pat. Uh, I just want to say, Mary McElhaney, Pat Dunn, uh, Vinnie O'Malley, we would not have this building without all the hard work all three of them have done. And uh, very, very thankful for that. Um, I always start these things off by saying good evening to all of you and uh, welcoming you to this building, uh, which those three have made possible. It's the site of the original St. Dominic's Church, built in 1822 and rebuilt in 1897. It is the heart and the center of Irish history in Maine, where we convene to honor our newest and the ninth recipient of the Clatter Award, Michael Connolly. Like those other three people, the Irish Heritage Center is a place he loves dearly and promotes constantly. So, as Pat said, and many of you have seen me too many times up here, uh, my name is Jerry Conley, Jr. And I'm not to be confused with this Conley, because these Conleys were the short version. <laughs> he spells his name Double N, double L, double cross. 
And also, <clears throat> I'm not to be confused with my father, Gerard P. Conley Sr., who's here tonight. He, he, he was the second CLAD uh, Award uh, winner. Um, and uh, at 86, uh, he thinks he's getting another one tonight. <laughs> and thinks this party's for him. As a matter of fact, after the Reverend finished, he said, was that the keynote? <laughs> well, it wasn't the keynote. And uh, we have, I don't know if there's anybody out here who isn't speaking tonight. But before we show the video, I'm really sorry about this, Governor Brennan, but we will get to you. <laughs> before we show the video, um, we have to have one speaker speak first because he happens to be Michael's boss. So he has to go first. And that would be Dr. DeLucos. He is our first speaker, and he is the president of St. Joseph's College. Dr. James Duclos has been the school's president for the past four years. Uh, Dr. Duclos has served as seven years as a vice president and dean of academic affairs with the College of St. Elizabeth uh, in Morristown, New Jersey, prior to coming to St. Joseph's. He also served for 16 years at Washington and Jefferson College uh, in Washington, Pennsylvania, prior to that. Uh, Dr. DeLucos has his PhD from the University of Virginia. Uh, but like Michael, he has one of his degrees from Boston College, and they also share the honor of having received a degree from Harvard. I'm sure he thought he had a lot in common with Michael, uh, but he won't think that after he sees the uh, video, <laughs> since he's going to find out about Michael's uh, eating disorder <clears throat> and the fact that he still has uh, the first dime from his communion money. <laughs> Without any further ado, Dr. DeLucos, please come up. Thank you all. Um, when Michael told me earlier this year that he was going to been chosen as the recipient of this award, uh, I was delighted for him, uh, and you could simply feel the excitement that he, as he shared that news with me. Um, and he asked me if I would say some words this evening, and so of course I said I would. Uh, and since then I've been wondering why he chose me, and now I begin to understand, because of all the folks in the room, I probably have the least dirt on him. <laughs> So I, I did what uh, college presidents do in situations like this. I went and I asked to see his personnel file. Uh, and it was, <laughs> it's standard practice. Um, and um, it is, it's a very full file because Michael has been associated with the college for quite a number of years. Um, um, he is nothing if not persistent. Um, one of the very first attempts Michael made to become part of the college community was an application for an assistant professor of history job, which unfortunately came in a week too late. <laughs> and he received a very nice letter back saying, uh, we got your application, um, but it was a week late. Um, we'll keep you in our thoughts. Um, um, Michael has, uh, over the years, uh, and the file is extraordinarily large. It's got all the things you'd expect in a personnel file endless contracts and endless letters from the dean congratulating Michael on receiving this or that recognition. Um, it's, a, it's a record of it's sort of the daily life of a faculty member. Um, we do the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, I say all the time, if you can't imagine saying the same thing a million times, you shouldn't be a, a teacher or a college <laughs> professor. Um, but it's something that we do always in a spirit of hope. We spend time with students every day, and we get to know them, and we speak with them, and we listen to their stories, uh, and we hope that someplace down the road, because we know they've got a lot going on as they're in front of us, um, many much more complicated lives than we could possibly imagine, but we hope that some things that we say, or some ideas that we offer, or some help that we provide uh, has a lasting impact. And we don't often know about those things until much later. So in all these endless contracts uh, that traces Michael's history with the college, uh, I found 
three letters from students. Uh, and they are, I think, a great testimony to Michael and what he does with students, uh, but also uh, to what teachers and faculty members in general do. And I want to share just a couple of those words because these are folks who know, who know Michael, who knew Michael um, much better than I do. Um, he comes to ask me money, for money every year for the cultural affairs series, and so, uh, and he always does it with a smile, uh, which is a great thing. I'm always happy to, to have Michael visit. The first is a letter from 2003 from a student who Michael had um, had in class and who uh, decided to transfer to a different college. Uh, and Michael, uh, always gracious, uh, obviously wrote her a very fine letter of recommendation. Uh, and she thought, with a little prompting from the school that accepted her, uh, to thank him. Uh, and so, the first of, of these tributes. She writes, I want, also want to thank you for what you do every day, teach, but more than that, you inspire. I have learned more in the two semesters of Western Civ than I think I ever learned. You taught me not only the three possible scenarios to explain Rome's fall, the way the Irish saved civilization, <laughs> and the difference between having a limited and absolute monarchy, but also to think for myself, to understand that history is the outcome of what happens in the present, and that in order to fully understand it, one must look beyond what is, what is in the present and apply what was in the past. The things that I have learned I am grateful for and I know will be forever embedded in my memory. So once again, thank you. A second student who also transferred. Do you just drive students away? <laughs> <laughs> Wrote after the fact to, to, to let Michael know he was gone uh, and to thank him for, for his assistance. He began um, in 2010, so 2003, 2010, and the most extraordinary one I'll save for last. <clears throat> Dear Dr. Connolly, I'm sure by now you have realized that I am not coming back for another year at St. Joseph's. I know I should have written you this letter a lot sooner, but I wasn't really sure what to say. I guess I'll start off by saying that you were the best professor I ever had. I truly enjoyed your classes, and for the first time in my life, I found myself looking forward to going to school on days when I had your class. You taught me so much and I'm sure I wouldn't be half the student I am today without the knowledge that you bestowed on me. You were a mentor to me throughout one of the hardest transitions in my life, and I don't think I could, would have been able to handle it as well as I did without you. It makes me wish I had had Michael in class. And in fact, I discovered in his personal file that I could have had the registration gods smiled on me when I was at Boston College because Michael was doing his PhD in history uh, during the time when I was an undergraduate there. So, but it didn't happen. Um, we did not meet in the classroom in that regard. The final letter is uh, extraordinary. And as I read it, you'll, you'll understand why. It arrived just um, last month. Hello, Michael. It's unlikely you'll re you'd remember me. I studied Western Civ with you at SJC from 1985 to 1986. You stirred an in interest in history for me, an interest which translated to a minor in history upon my transfer. Oh, a third transfer student. <laughs> have to conduct a more full investigation. <laughs> Upon my transfer to Ohio University to study telecommunications, I pondered the road untraveled. We discussed Celtic history and my interest in Irish, my Irish heritage. I'm grateful, re gratefully reminded of your support. I write tonight to tell, let you know of your, of your enduring impact. I've just started a PhD degree at nearly 50 years old and will soon be teaching graduate students to see, who seek to become clinical mental health counselors. As I conceptualize lectures, I recall only a partial refrain. I'm sure I've forgotten part of it. And the significance of this is, faculty members over time get known for phrases, and clearly this is Michael's, as he pulls out of students, the more important part. And the significance of this is, 
I cannot begin to describe how much that phrase and your effort shaped my curiosity over the years. And now I hope to do the same for others. We shall see. Thanks much and best wishes from a grateful learner. Our students' words speak more loudly and more clearly than I ever could about the impact that Michael Connolly has had on St. Joseph's College, on the students who study with us and with him. We are delighted that you have chosen to recognize Michael with this year's Clada Award. We are proud to have him as a colleague. We have a large contingent from the college here. They'll give you a roaring cheer in a second when I stop, because they know I will stop eventually. <laughs> We're delighted to have Michael as one of ours uh, and to share him with you. Congratulations, Michael. Thank you, Doctor. As with uh, most Irish gatherings, there are always a few surprises. And we have uh, one now. Uh, I would like to say that we have a uh, surprise guest here uh, who is going to uh, read a letter from Senator uh, Susan Collins, who, uh, uh, you know, not surprisingly sent an emissary uh, since she heard there were going to be so many Brennans here. <laughs> and especially his friends. So I would like to call our surprise guest up who would like to uh, read uh, Senator Collins's letter. Hi. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> um, I'm here tonight to represent Senator Susan Collins. Um, she's unable to be here tonight, but I offer to attend um, because Dr. Connolly was very persistent in whether I would attend tonight. And um, I live in Washington, and uh, <laughs> so I took a plane this morning and flew in and um, been patiently waiting in like a closet back there <laughs> so he wouldn't see me. Um, so it's a wonderful honor to be here, both for Senator Collins and um, to recognize Dr. Connolly and all of his work. Um, so I'd like to read a letter that the senator has wrote for him. It reads, Dear Mike, Congratulations on receiving the ninth annual Kledeg Award from the Maine Irish Heritage Center. This wonderful honor underscores your loyalty, friendship, and passion. You have displayed these attributes through your devotion of teaching Irish history at St. Joseph's College, your longstanding commitment to the Maine Irish Heritage Center, and your scholastic publications and endeavors regarding the Irish heritage in the Portland community and across our entire state. With at least three of your former students serving now or previously as members of my staff, I have no doubt of the quality of your work. As a fellow Irish American, I am delighted to join the Maine Irish American community in applauding your well-earned award. Congratulations again and best wishes for your continued success. Sincerely, Senator Susan Collins. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> I'd also like to take a few moments to just say a few words about Dr. Connolly and how I know him on a personal level. Because you are all here tonight, you already know just how special Dr. Connolly truly is. I cannot say enough how truly fitting this award is for him. First, I could speak of his loyalty. When I was a student of Dr. Connolly's, he was loyally late to every class. <laughs> In fact, he was so de consistently late that I deliberated tonight if I should show up late, because I'd probably be on time. <laughs> But he always made up for his belated arrival by holding us after class. <laughs> so you should all plan here to be night later than you expected. <laughs> Second, I could speak for his love. From befriending his dear partner, Becky, I have seen firsthand how strong their love is for one another. If you know Dr. Connolly, you know he always maintains a cheerful demeanor in every stride he takes. I like to think that men are only as happy as they keep their women. <laughs> <laughs> but most of all, I think I can speak best of his friendship. 
Dr. Connolly can befriend just about anyone. Once you get to know him, you will learn he will do just about anything for a Snickers bar. <laughs> <laughs> picked up on this, in fall 2014, I waged a bet with Dr. Connolly about the elections. I bet that the Republicans would win the majority of the Senate. Dr. Connolly bet that the Democrats would win the majority. Well, as you know, the Republicans did take the majority of the Senate in 2014. As a consolation prize, I decided to tape a few Snickers to his office door with a cleverly written note that says, Here's something sweet for your bitter loss. <laughs> this election cycle, I'm not waging any bets. <laughs> Dr. Connolly, I have always appreciated your mentorship as a professor, and also your and Becky's friendship, as I have graduated and moved on from St. Joseph's. Dr. Connolly, you truly epitomize love and passion for your vocation. You deeply care for each and every student who takes a seat in your class. You know your students by name, not number. You spend countless hours preparing lessons, activities, and events to make your classroom come to life. You have worked into the late hours of the night to reach new scholastic heights. I sincerely hope that tonight is just one of the many upcoming triumphs for your efforts to preserve Irish heritage history across Maine. I'm willing to wage a Snickers bar on that. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Sarah. That uh, was worth the trip from DC, right? Uh, in keeping with uh, political fashion, apparently, uh, our Congress uh, woman was also unable to make it. Uh, so she sent a letter, which I will read uh, prior to our video, um, and unlike um, the Irish Senator Collins, um, she's not Irish, so it is very brief. <laughs> and I think she's out looking for her opponent, whoever that may be. <laughs> Professor Michael Connolly, St. Joseph's College, Standish, Maine. Dear Michael, gives me great pleasure to congratulate you on receiving the 2016 16 Clatter Award from the Maine Irish Heritage Center. You have rightfully earned your place among a, a prestigious group of recipients that includes Governor Joseph E. Brennan and Senator George Mitchell. Your writing and research has given us all a better understanding of the many contributions Irish Americans have made to the state of Maine. Moreover, for many Mainers who have Irish roots and are rightly proud of them, you have offered a window into the lives of their ancestors. Thanks to you, the hard work, perse perseverance, and dreams of the individuals who came from Ireland so long ago will not be forgotten. I deeply admire the Maine Irish Heritage Center for bringing together Maine's Irish community and celebrating exemplary individuals from its ranks. They have made a wonderful choice in honoring you this year. Shelley Pingree, Member of Congress. With that, I will now give uh, Mr. Mahoney the high sign to start our video. <laughs> Renaissance man, um, which says nothing about his age, age of course. How motivational he is. He does think about others and he thinks about, about the welfare of others and, and how can he help to make the world a better place. We all know is he has the, the blessing of the gift of the gab. One of my earliest memories is walking down Congress Street with Michael. I forget what the errand was, but walking down from uh, Congress Square to Monument Square, and in that short space, I think he must have run into six or seven people that he knew, and I, I found that that was par for the course with Michael, and 
my wife and I uh, began to think of him as the Lord Mayor of Portland because he, he just knew everybody and, uh, and was always glad to stop and, and talk to them uh, like he was running for office, you know, kissing hands and shaking babies. He needs to, to make sure that he maximizes everything. So he wasn't just a Boy Scout, he wasn't just an Eagle Scout. He found out that there were these palms that you could get that would go onto your Eagle badge. And that there were three of them, I believe, and he made sure that he had all three because nobody was gonna get anything over on Mike. I love how gracious he is uh, and how kind he is and how generous in sharing himself and his work with, with everybody. We know Michael's a great researcher. Uh, he's a great historian, great writer. I mean, he always did well in school and um, was pretty smart, but I don't know if we would have said he was gonna be a professor. No. The Portland Cayley Band, we'd do Cayleys for the Irish American Club four to six times a year and have been doing that pretty much all along, and Michael's been our piano player. He's a self-taught piano player, and uh, very good man with the rhythm. Been playing with him, I think I must have played in at least several hundred, if not a thousand and, or more, Cayleys uh, and contra dances and wakes and weddings and um, just, all sorts of things. He's even written a novel many people don't know about. Maybe I shouldn't divulge that secret. He's written a novel about a day in the life of Portland back around the turn of the century. Mike set up a scholarship fund um, several years ago now, probably six years ago. And the fund is in memory of our mom and our dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike has funded this scholarship. It started out the first three years, there was one recipient. And for the last three years, there's been two recipients every year. And the scholarship um, is, is very generous and continues for each year that the student is in college um, if they maintain uh, a very reasonable grade point average. So um, it's a really nice thing, a very generous thing, and kind of a typical thing for Mike to do. He was the first. He got all the attention. Everything was all about Mike, and I think he kind of liked that. And when we came along, he tolerated us at best. Yeah, barely. I think that's, yeah, and barely. he tolerated some better than others. This is the only family um, photograph that we have, so we're really fortunate to have it. Yeah, this was how we saw ourselves uh, as a family. It's mm -hmm. also how the neighbors saw the Connollys uh, down there, but I'm just not sure if it's the way Mike saw the family. Definitely not the way Mike saw us. Growing up in his late teens, early 20s, um, we saw some pretty dramatic changes. He graduated from high school in 69, at the height of the Vietnam War. In 1970, our mm -hmm. dad died, uh, and I think that those two things really uh, shaped Mike in a different way. He definitely became a bit more serious around that time. He also got uh, a heck of a lot easier to live with, and I think that was the beginning of the Mike that the, we see today. Right, right. You know, aware of other things and other people and how people were treated, mm -hmm. um, things going on in the world. Yeah, neither of our parents finished no. high school, no. but they instilled in us the importance of, of education. Certainly he caught on to that. Mm -hmm. uh, he made a career out of being a student for, for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I remember uh, I had a, a week off in the summer a few years ago and didn't go anywhere, didn't go away. So I just popped in, I sat in on one of his classes. He captivated the audience would, would, you know, and he brought everything back and, and listened to all their questions and answered all the questions. I mean, he's a great teacher. He told me that when he was uh, in school in Ireland, um, he uh, went out to visit the relatives in, in Ireland, in Connemara, and he was staying at the house, and they told a story about his father who had um, gone into the town for the evening and uh, on his way back from town he uh, he saw one of the neighbor's cows had become uh, detached from its tether and was walking along the road so 
he, he brought the cow back uh, to the neighbor, and the neighbor, and the neighbor said, oh, it's not our cow at all. And, and so he didn't know where to go with the cow, so he brought the cow home. So um, much to the delight of uh, the parents. And I don't know what happened to the cow or that part of the story, but the story continues because Mike was over visiting, and this is back in the days when, you know, there were lots of Europeans hitchhiking around Ireland, and... Um, there still are, I'm sure, but um, Mike went into Galway, and um, I guess he went, went off to a dance or something like this, and uh, he bumped into a couple of uh, Swedish girls who were uh, at the dance, and they had their bicycles, and they didn't have a place to stay, so he took it upon himself to say, well, you'd, you'd be welcome to come out and stay at the relative's place without any trouble at all. They'd be happy to have you, so... Mike shows up back at the house really quite late at night, and uh, of course they're having tea at about 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning, and, and uh, there's some snickering from the relatives as Mike comes in, in the door and sits with these two Swedish girls, and, and um, uh, Mike's relatives say, well, this is uh, quite an event. She's, you know, we told you the story about your father going into Galway and coming back, and finding a cow and bringing a cow home. And you go into Galway and you come back and what you brought home. He has this wonderful trilogy of books, the John Ford book that he worked on with me, uh, City by the Sea, and of course they changed their skies. Probably every Portlander who is interested in history should have those three books, right? I'll put a plug in for those. But um, Michael made sure that uh, our manuscript was free of errors. And uh, I did, after getting to know him, I decided to gift him with a copy of one of my books. Uh, and uh, Michael got it, and, and uh, he must have looked at it the first night a little bit and being curious. And uh, he got back to me the next morning by email, and he said, by the way, did you realize on page such and such the word cavalry was misspelled? And I used that term several times in the book. But uh, on one, one, in one context, I had misused it. Instead of referring to the horse troop, it was spelled referring to the, you know, the biblical reference. And uh, the only thing Michael said about the book that I'd given him is, uh, you know, um, you've, you've got a misspelling on page such and such. So uh, as, as Michael uh, also likes to relate, you know, my, my response to him at the time was, well, was there anything that you like, anything that you like about the book? And I really still haven't gotten an answer to that uh, to this day. I was having luncheon for four people from Belfast who were chaperones with the Irish children or former chaperones. And I invited our friend, Cata Concanon, who was 103 years old at the time. So we're sitting having lunch outside because Catherine couldn't go up the stairs. And she's eating, she loved to do. So Mike decided he was going to be cute. And he said, when I first met Claire, for my tea, she gave me half and half. Then later on, she gave me milk for my tea. And guess what she's giving me now? And without stopping to eat with a mouthful of food, Catherine piped up and said, and I notice you're still hanging around her. One day we were at his house and we were having tea or lunch and talking and he said, aren't we the luckiest people in the world to have such wonderful heritage and such wonderful culture? And I had never really thought about myself or my culture uh, that way before. And, but, it, but when I think of it, it makes my heart uh, light and uh, it's, uh, it's a lovely sentiment to, to remember him by. Groups of us would have uh, music sessions and um, it would go from house to house and it would be usually a potluck affair and um, and Mike would show up and just basically eat everything on the table and people were uh, given the message to Mike that you might want to think about bringing something so uh, another Sunday comes around with a music session and um, the food comes out on the table and it's a bit late, as Mike usually shows up a bit late. And um, he comes in with, uh, and he's got, um, he's got some, a, pot, a big bag of food, it looks like. He comes in and he takes out this bag, opens this box and takes this box out. And 
is from Dunkin Donuts <laughs> and uh, and he opens it up and it's donut holes <laughs> from Dunkin Donuts and not only are they Dunkin Donut donut holes they're day old <laughs> <laughs> so we got a great deal on them <laughs> Hill. he was giving me a tour one time on Munjoy Hill and showing me a few things and not just the John Ford sites and uh, we actually wound up taking shortcuts through people's kitchens. He would just knock on the door and immediately chat with someone, and then we'd sort of walk through the kitchen to chat with the family, and Michael knew everybody in the family, and then we'd move on to the next house. So it was the first time I'd been around Munjoy Hill where we walked through some of the houses unexpectedly. Years ago, he and I went to Arla together, and he went his way. We were there for six weeks, saw him a few times. Then on our way back, my sister and her husband drove us to Shannon. Uh, we checked in and then went out to visit with my family and a mutual friend from Belfast. So everybody was having a good time talking. I checked my watch and decided, well, I think it's time we go to the plane. So Michael goes, huh? Can't you tell somebody that doesn't travel very much? She's anxious. So I thought about it. I figure I won't say anything. But to myself, I said, chuck him along. I'll get you later, and which means my day will come. So they chatted for a little while longer, and I started to say it again. And over the loudspeaker came this voice with the last two passengers for Boston, please come, you're holding the plane up. So we rushed on, we get on the plane, everybody is glaring at us because they had been waiting for 10 minutes. When we got to our seat, Mike makes the announcement. He said, oh, my poor old mother, she's not feeling well. Everybody started apologizing for being nasty or whatever, not one person asked me how I felt. And I had an answer, which was, I'm feeling fine. He's being an Amadon as usual. Peter and I, or his brother Peter, are watching football and we invite our two brothers over. My brother Marty and, his, and, and Michael, Peter Conley, who I'm hanging out with a lot, and. Uh, so we invite my brother Marty and Michael over to watch football on a Sunday living up on Spring Street when Peter was living up there. So I'm playing Trivia Pursuit and watching football and you know, having a few laughs. And uh, so at the time, uh, Peter's wife had made a couple of pies and so we broke, you know, it was halftime, said, hey, it's time for pie. And so we, she happened to make a chocolate cream pie and a pumpkin pie. And so uh, it just so worked out that Peter and I had the chocolate cream pie and my brother Marty and Michael, finally Michael had the uh, pumpkin pie. So we ate, drank coffee, and I think we may have played a little more Trivial Pursuit. And then as it went, both my brother and his, Peter's brother, Michael, left. So, of course, in a very short time, it was time for more pie, of course, right? And so we decided we'll try the pumpkin pie. So me and Peter both grab it, take a piece out and get a coffee, and then we both take a bite and we spit it out immediately and start screaming. Like that's, what is wrong with this? And so what we found out was when Pam came on, she forgot to add sugar to a pumpkin pie. Oh, wow. Well, there's some pies you can add, no, as you, so my brother and Michael ate that pie. So we saw them a week later and we asked them, said, hey, how was that pumpkin pie? And they both said, yeah, it was very good. Yeah, it was delicious. <laughs> so I'm not exactly what that no. says about Michael, uh, in, he'll, that he'll eat anything or that he's just too damn polite for his own good. He loves my scones. I make, I make, you know, the original and authentic scones and sometimes brown bread, uh, which uh, is a staple uh, in, in Connemara, where I come from. And um, of course, I make some uh, extra for anybody that comes um, that is of Irish heritage if they'd like to take home their little doggy bags for breakfast the next day. Uh, one time we were doing a gig together, a wedding. And actually, it was in Kenny Bunkport and a really fancy place right down on the water and uh, there are a bunch of us and we all arrived and uh, um, I, think, I think we played the preview uh, the, the service and then we came 
and we were playing a, a little bit of a cocktail hour before the wedding. And um, we, a bunch of us set up and um, we're getting ready to play. And Mike was in the band, he was playing guitar, backup guitar in the band. And we're getting ready to play and people are getting anxious, they want some music, you know. And we're about to start playing and Mike's not around, you can't find him anywhere. And um, so we start playing the first tune, and I'm playing away. And all of a sudden, I look over my left shoulder, and there's Mike standing there with an 18-inch diameter plate full of deviled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and he's eating deviled eggs, <laughs> passing deviled eggs around. He stole the friggin' platter off the buffet <laughs> table. And this is a classy event, too. I mean, we're lucky we didn't get thrown out of it. <laughs> if, it's, if it's free, <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Many times I've seen these uh, superb presentations by Michael, but he'll take time before the presentation to thank people for being there. And not just to do that, but sometimes to thank people individually. And uh, I hadn't really seen that done to such a degree before. And, 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 and sometimes Michael, you know, made everybody feel at home. But sometimes he would thank people individually, almost the entire audience, so that by the time he was finished, there was no time left whatsoever for the presentation. So luckily, we gave him a little bit of extra time and heard that. We actually had a, uh, have a picture of him actually reaching into his wallet, paying for lunch. Uh, this is a fact that uh, both Becky and I can swear to, and I actually have photographic evidence that he, he actually did pay for a lunch. Of course, it was after we got him a honorarium <laughs> of a hundred dollars. He bought us sandwiches, yeah. <laughs> small sandwiches too. Amazing. We're going to have to listen to it forever. Yeah. And the fact that you made us <laughs> do this video, right. that would be That's the biggest reason right. that uh, right. Mike shouldn't. But we have this. final editing. That's on right. This. We've been promised. We've been promised. <laughs> <laughs> if I put myself in the perspective of Becky, let's say, who knows him well, uh, Becky would probably say, I'm guessing, that he shouldn't receive that award because it will go to his head. Becky Hitchcock is lifelong. Great, Another great, great person. addition to yeah. our family. We've, we've loved having her uh, in it and around it. And uh, yeah, and she deals with Mike, so uh, she so takes the pressure us. Off, <laughs> off us. The one thing that could possibly disqualify Michael from from any sort of public service award is his uh, severe and crippling shyness. What are your three behalf? August er er en Mariella går to en klæd award. Simlin fik jeg sjældent. August behærdet er all Mariella de abber indsja abortland August August amen. Tastar August ha lien lien tra faki had le din en nyeren agun abortland August amen elig August gnyerne gnyerne to job all in lesson. August Kasu de Hill Le Grasta August Dinitu the uh the Aber Le Grasta Freshen Nayari Urhito uh Rich Shrivito August Napaperi August Nishkela Nishkelti uh Durto August the Hyol August the Tamuj Hobbihaslat Ta um Minchi Nahirish Heritage Center uh on Bihaslat August um I don't know about it, I that. I guess the testing when you're all at, go will merge on Frodul, I guess, go will grow and let, I guess, slantia, slantia, a hort, which at a, at a, at a, no orcha, go to me in my head. Uh, in the Irish tradition, uh, one has to pray when uh, one is offering a congratulations. Uh, that's to ward off um, bad luck or jealousy or pride. Uh, and uh, so the um, blessing actually uh, literally says, uh, you are shaped by God. And uh, 
all of us at the Irish Heritage Center are just so proud of your work uh, that you have done uh, with uh, grace uh, and lived your life with grace and uh, the, her the, uh, um, the um, legacy that you have left all of us uh, of Irish heritage here in Portland. And uh, we thank you, we just love you, and, um, and we offer you blessings. I know I speak for Mary, but we couldn't be prouder than to have Mike for a brother and as an example for us. Mm. Well, Michael, uh, I, there, there's nothing that I'd say to your face that I wouldn't repeat behind your back, but uh, I, I wish you well and congratulations on this award. It's, it's well deserved be, des despite your, uh, your, your impediments. Um, uh, congratulations and a long life to you. I want to say, Ko Harges, Agus Gunyari, Antoalat, Miho. Basically, you, uh, you listen to what he has to say. And if you can get a word in edgewise, you're doing well. I, I moved his damn piano twice, and th there will be no third time, Michael. I know, I, I say all the time that the world could use a whole lot more of my comments in it. A little soldier song from Mike to keep soldiering on to. I've been to all previous Clara celebrations, and I've been the MC for most of them. And I've seen every video made for each of our recipients. And this one, by far, is the longest. <laughs> I truly believe, as the credit said, that our earnest recipient actually did direct, produce, <laughs> film, and edit this thing. Gone with the wind was shorter. <laughs> As his friend suggested, our guest of honor has long lobbied for frugality to be considered one of the seven heavenly virtues so that he could claim that he possessed at least one of them. <laughs> well, that's not the only thing he wasn't frugal about. Uh, was the length of this 24-minute self-addressed Valentine, which we just watched. <laughs> Is there any reason to have any speakers now? <laughs> Unfortunately, the program is set. Our executive director, Mr. O'Malley, might be serving us breakfast before this thing is over. <laughs> Typically, I'd spend about 20 minutes talking about our Munjoy Hill hero, telling you the real truth about him, but there's no time for that since he insisted that you hear from about 20 of his best friends about what a great Irishman he is. Just want all you speakers to know, except for you, Governor, you're all on a clock. Some of us in this room have an early mass tomorrow morning, though it certainly won't be me. Actually, I've looked around at this crowd, and I uh, know a lot of you. Let's, let's face it. 
Most of you don't even get out anymore. Some of you haven't been out since Kennedy was president. But as a good Irishman said to me, when you're dead, you're dead for a long, long time. So tonight, we're going to enjoy ourselves just a little bit more. And so with that, we I would like to introduce our next speaker, the very first CLADA recipient, person I've had the privilege of introducing many, many times, someone, trust me, who does not come out for just anyone, a person who represents the pinnacle of Irish achievements here in Maine, one of the state's greatest governors, our very own Joseph E. Brennan. First, I want to say I'm always somewhat apprehensive when I'm on a program with Jerry. Jerry's known as the great local eulogist. And, <laughs> no, really, it's just, I've heard it so many times, and he gets better all the time. But I'm delighted that we're going to talk about someone who's alive for a while. <laughs> and I know he's made some unkind comments about the length of some of the proceedings. It makes me think when I was in Congress, uh, Congressman Mo Udall, really a funny guy. After a debate went on for a long, long time, he'd get up and say, I think everything's been said. It's just that not everybody has said it. <laughs> but, but, but I'm glad to uh, have a chance to speak about Michael. Uh, it's really kind of easy for me. I won't be as lengthy as some of the other, you know, aspects of this <laughs> that, uh, we, we have many things in common, many similarities. Uh, our families uh, not only come from County Galway, but they come from the same tiny little area called Califinish. That's where my parents were from. But uh, my parents, my father particularly, after immigrating from Galway in the early part of the last century, my father and Michael's grandfather found work on the Portland docks, loading and unloading ships. Michael and I both grew up on Munjoy Hill. Is there another place? <laughs> and, and, and in his book, he does mention over in Ireland something uh, people can live about a mile apart, but things are so different. When I was growing up at Monjoy Hill, going to cathedral school, I thought this St. Dominic's area was rather weird, strange, <laughs> and, and almost like another country. Michael points that out. It's very dull, very sophisticated. And we, we, we only lived a couple of streets apart up there. Uh, we both, uh, as has been mentioned, would might have degrees from Boston College. His is a lot more elite than mine, a PhD in history. I don't know much history. <laughs> and uh, after tonight, if it's ever over, <laughs> I'm sorry, we will both be the proud recipients of the Clatter Award. We did go to different high schools. I was going to say something about that, but my wife said, no, you can't insult the guy. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> he went to Portland, I went to Sheriff's. He would like to have gone to Sheriff's, but there was an entrance exam. <laughs> it has been mentioned earlier, I want to commend uh, the Conley family, you know, Mary and his brother Peter for the giving of uh, resources to help kids uh, get through college. It's so crazily expensive now. I'm sorry, Mr. President of St. Joseph's. It's a real deal there, though, 26,000, if you know somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at any rate, it is. It's, it shows that uh, they haven't forgotten where they came from, and they're giving back to the community. And I commend, I say, uh, uh, Way to go, Conley family. Thank 
and, it, and it does relate to this event here because many of the kids at Portland High School, you know, are immigrants and uh, they need every bit of help they can get. And it's important that you have forgotten, you haven't forgotten where you came from. And I, I, I do want to commend the Connolly family for doing that. And I have to say that uh, I learned a lot about my Irish heritage from reading Michael's writings, and I mean that. Uh, even though my parents spoke Gaelic, they're from Ireland, they didn't speak Gaelic except when they didn't want the kids to understand what was going on. <laughs> but uh, the, um, you know, and my seven brothers and sisters, you know, after they became adults, doing okay, they wanted to um, send my mother back to Ireland to the place of her birth. You'll find this interesting, she had no interest, no way. <laughs> I mean, they left an impoverished Ireland. She thought America, I don't want to get into Trump, gonna make it great again. She thought it was pretty great then. <laughs> and, and really, she says, no way. And it's interesting, I've talked to other people that some of their parents with a similar background felt the same way. Whereas many second, third, and fourth uh, descent uh, of our generations of Irish descent love to go to Ireland. I'm among them. I have some friends that have gone 25 or 30 times. I got a long way to go to catch them. I've only been a couple of times. But uh, it, it, it is interesting how people that grew up, and I think people that might have read Angela's Ashes would understand it. It was a tremendous struggle. And there's no question this was the promised land. There was tremendous opportunity, and many of them, uh, you know, took advantage of it. But I want to say to, to Michael, I commend you for your writings. They are excellent. I've gotten a lot out of them, and I like the fact that you give me free books. <laughs> You're the only one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, there are some Irish that are very close with the dollar. I, I don't know. If, Michael qualifies, uh, but I, I do want to congratulate you. Uh, it, it's uh, been a lot of fun here tonight, and uh, I'm waiting for the next six hours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. I just never get tired of this guy, ever. So proud. Uh, our next uh, speaker is my favorite elected mayor of all time in the city of Portland. A good man, a good friend of Michael's, and like pretty much everybody else in this room, probably related to him. But a delight to have here former Portland mayor Michael Brennan. Well, thank you very much. And Michael, thank you for inviting me to be here tonight. This is the first time that I've ever followed Governor Brennan uh, in speaking. And I think Michael showed remarkable courage inviting two Brennans to speak on the same night. <laughs> or it was a unique display of poor judgment. So we'll wait and see. But when I first ran, first office I ever ran for in the city of Portland was to be on the Cumberland Counter County Charter Commission. And I ran unopposed. That's how important an office it was. And the reporter kept calling me and saying, are you related to Joe Brennan, because governor at the time? And I, kept, I said to him, I said, you know, I have a cousin who says that if you go back that we're like third cousins related to so and so. So a couple days later in the newspaper, it comes out and says, Michael Brennan, who's running for Charter Commission, is third cousin <laughs> to Governor Joe Brennan. As if, who would ever claim to be a third cousin? <laughs> so I called up the reporter and I said, look, I told you that this was a very tenuous connection. I can't really document this and everything like that. So the next day it comes out in the newspaper, Michael Brennan claims no relationship. <laughs> to Governor Joe Brennan. So I know that Joe's mother was trying to figure out who the hell is this guy. <laughs> but I want to say tonight, Joe Brennan not only is a friend of mine,
but he is a relative and a cousin. <laughs> so, so I want to formally acknowledge that, and thank you <laughs> for all those things. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to meet with Martin Keene, who's a journalist from Ireland who is here covering the event in hopes of writing an article about this award that Michael so richly deserves. And he asked me if I'd ever met my grandmother. My grandmother came over from Ireland in Ishni, 1909, and settled in Portland. She was 14 years old. She had a sixth grade education. She ended up raising, she was widowed very young, and she ended up raising all four children in Portland by cleaning houses for wealthy people in the west end of Portland and preparing food at Maine Medical Center. And I thought the question when he said, have you ever met your grandmother? And I said, yes. I'd met her on a number of occasions when I was living in Portland. And then when we left Portland, she came to visit us and I'd have an opportunity to see her in the summer. But after the interview, I thought about the fact that my son, both my sons, would not meet their great-grandmother. My granddaughter would not meet my grandmother. And many of us sitting here today, our connection to our parents, grandparents, and Ireland, we are outliving and outgrowing. But we have Michael Connolly, who has provided that bridge from our families from Ireland to our future generations, to our children, to our grandchildren. That's an incredible gift that you have given, not only to the city of Portland, but to the state of Maine and to the country. That my children, my grandchildren, will now understand what it means to be Irish, what it means to have an Irish history. And they won't be able to learn that from my grandmother who came from Ireland, but they can learn it from Michael, Michael Conley because of the work that he has done and because of the Irish Heritage Center and the legacy that it is creating for future generations. So Martin, thank you for asking me the question, and it was very helpful. But also, as part of the discussion, part of the discussion, was that the Irish have endured social injustice, poverty, unemployment, loss of family, things that many, many other cultures, people don't endure. And on top of that, huge political injustice. And Jerry Conley Jr. has been far more eloquent and far more articulate than I have been about talking about this issue. But it's the obligation that we have as the Irish, because of our history, because of our legacy, that when we're elected governor, when we're elected senators, when we're elected state representatives, we have a special obligation to those people that are in need. We have a special obligation to address social justice issues. We have a special obligation to make sure that children in need and families in need are looked after. And Michael Conley reminds us of that obligation every day not only because of his teachings, but because of his writings. And that obligation is profoundly important for us as the Irish here in Portland and in the state of Maine because it makes us who we are. And thank you for reminding us of that obligation and reminding us what the heart and the soul of being Irish means today and tomorrow. So congratulations on your award and thank you very much for allowing my sons and my granddaughter to understand what it means to be Irish and the obligation that comes with being Irish.
Very, very nice job, Michael. May, make us proud there, too.